So there you see it, the US 3-1 losers against Germany in East Hartford, Connecticut. 3.48, wow, look at the expected goals mm. there for Germany. Certainly had their chances. Time to welcome into the show our good friend and colleague, Casey Keller. Casey, what would you make of the U.S. performance? The moments where you normally expect the U.S. to be successful, and that's on the counterattack, and that's where they were good. Uh, I think this idea still, this, this process that the U.S. is going to be uh, – in possession, they're going to dominate teams. They're going to, you know, beat them with the ball. But in the end, what it comes down to, it comes down to the U.S.'s athleticism where they show their best. So there was a disconnect, I thought, between the midfield and the defense. They dropped into a defensive shape okay, but then didn't put enough pressure higher up the ball, allowed Germany to have so much possession on the top of their 18. Uh, I think Stevie just mentioned it, full crew could have had a hat trick. He had two really good chances in the first half that he that he missed. Uh, but the U.S. again show at times that when they get out on the break and they use their pace and they use their athleticism in the attacking third, they can be a difficult opponent for sides. But it's 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 really now up to Greg to to figure out you know kind of how can he play this team? Yes, against the Uzbekistan's and the Oman's and you know, maybe some CONCACAF competition. You can keep the ball, you can pass it around teams, and, and you can win that way. But we're still trying to find that United States team to play against the quality of Germany. And let's be honest, this is a German side that's been very poor over the last year and a half or so. This isn't a German side that we're used to seeing. And I think we saw aspects of that even in this match defensively, where Nagelsmann has a lot of work to do if they're going to be competitive in the Euros. But the U.S. against the opposition of the likes of a Germany, you know, still aren't able to control the game through possession. And if that's the case, fine. Play a particular way that gives you an opportunity to get a result against a side like Germany because through possession it wasn't going to happen today. U.S. looked, Ali, in the first half like maybe they could hang. What happened in the second half? <laughs> Maybe they could hang. I mean, uh, am I exaggerating? No. They had their chances in the first half beyond just the Christian Pulisic goal. Okay, time. so if we're going to focus on the one or two half chances that the United States had in the first half, then I think that's ignoring what was happening on the other side of the field. Nicholas Fulkrug himself is responsible for the expected goals of 3.48, right? He, we talked about hat trick, easily should have had a hat trick. It's 100% opportunities for him, both in the first half and the second half. The lack of recognition that the United States had defensively in the first half and second half, that is a mismatch, Leroy Sané getting after Serginho Des. It's a mismatch. It's just not going to work. And so Leroy Sané, any time that he decided either to cut to the outside or in particular to the inside, there has to be help coming from the midfield. There has to be help from the center back. There has to be help from the trailing player. And when you look at the goal from Germany, the, their first goal, the game-tying goal, Leroy Sané cuts to the inside, and Christy Pulisic is in a position where he can get behind the ball, where he can go at the very least make it uncomfortable for Leroy Sané. And what does he do? This is Captain America, right? He gave it the old, oh, I'm, I'm going to pretend I'm going to get there, but I'm really not. And so there is no help coming from the trailing players. There is no help coming from the central midfielders. The center backs are too late to step out. And by that time, then Germany and Leroy Sané are just walking through you. They're just passing the ball through you. It becomes a 5v2 situation. And they were so very good in the times in which they got in and around the 18-yard box. Finding Musiala, finding Gundor, finding Leroy Sané. And then eventually the chance falls to Fulcrook and he's unable to finish. But had Germany actually been efficient in front of goal, this is not 3-1. This is a far larger score. And we're not talking about the United States potentially hanging. Mm. Yes, they were hanging in the first half, second half, different level from Germany and the, and the United States simply could not respond. Stevie, as a manager, you look at this U.S. performance, what's your biggest worry? My biggest worry is that this team doesn't defend until it's too late. You know, you have to defend as a team, as a unit, further up the park. It's too late when you've got Sani and Musiala running at you just outside the box because you can't, 
you can't challenge. You're too scared to go near them because they're coming at you too quickly. And if you make a mistake there, you're in big trouble. So that means that you have to defend further up. And that means that Balligan, listen, as good, as, as, as dangerous at times as they looked on the break mm -hmm. with Balligan and, and Pulisic uh, and Weir and Moussa's pace uh, and, and Reina's guile, that's not enough. They have to do a job when they don't have the ball. And that means they have to be part of a defensive unit that stops the opposition from the halfway line to maybe halfway towards the edge of the box. That's where you need to be defending, not at the top of your box. Because against good players, you're in trouble. Little one-twos, little pieces of brilliance from individuals. You're in big trouble. The big storyline coming into this from the U.S. perspective was Gio Reyna back with the team, back with Greg Berhalter. Casey, I wonder what you made of his performance. We only did get to see him for the first 45 minutes. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think DeMarcus Beasley said it on the broadcast that he was a little surprised after only playing, you know, 26 minutes uh, since June that he actually started. But I, I get that. I think what Greg just wanted to do was just put all this behind it. Say, OK, look, I'm going to start Gio. We're in camp together. Everything's fine. We're going to move forward with this relationship, as you read a hundred times this week. And uh, I think Gio was solid. I, I think it's a good opposition uh, where, you know, it wasn't as if the U.S. was going to dominate in possession and Gio was going to be the, the playmaker from a withdrawn position. It just wasn't going to happen against this quality of opposition. But, but I, thought, I thought it was a good, it was a good outing and... You know, obviously, the, I think the guys made very, very, you know, valid points about where the U.S. needs to go forward, you know, with the Gio Reyna, with obviously, you know, that, you know, the, the midfield that the U.S. has with, with Musa and McKinney. I mean, you got guys playing at big teams in big leagues, but there was a disconnect there. And, you know, Ollie and Stevie pointed it out very well. That is what Greg and his coaching staff are going to have to look from this quality of opposition, where this team can learn to defend as a team and attack as a team. It's one thing, you know, here's three, four guys that are quick against a slow German defense. And if they cheat a little bit, like Ollie pointed out with Pulisic on the one play that cost him a goal, yeah, you're going to look great on the counterattack if you're not worried about getting back behind a player and, and helping them defend. So, so yeah, there is a, there's a lot of things they learned from this. And I think the one nice thing about the Geo greg situation in this match is it's finished. Now nobody needs to talk about it anymore. And let's just go forward and, and, and be better against opposition like the quality of Germany. I know we saw it in the highlight. I don't want to brush past it. The Christian Pulisic goal, special, yeah? Absolutely special. And what you see there is a player who feels very good about himself right now and very, very good about his surroundings and his experience and his environment and feels excited to be on the field, expects to play every weekend, is delivering results for Milan, is productive in the way that he's playing, and he's carrying that level of confidence to the national team. So when you see this sort of execution for Christian Pulisic, that's why people get crazy about Christian Pulisic in this country. That's what they get hopeful. That's what they, they get ahead of themselves. Because when you they, say people, are you saying me? <laughs> well, yes, when, when you're not supporting the Mexican yeah, national you know team. Was, you know <laughs> yes. So that's when people get crazy about uh, Christian Pulisic because they see this and they go, wait, 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 wait. This is different. This is different. We don't see this all the time, and we certainly don't see it enough from American players. And so to see this from Pulisic, it's, it's, it's what really fills you with hope. Now you need to see it with consistency. Now you do it against Germany. What I would say to Christian Pulisic, as great as that was, if I were him, I would look at the video that, of the goal that was allowed by the United States, the first goal, and say, I could have done a little more. Mm. I could, and take responsibility for that as well. And, and to be fair, when you think of the, the overall performance of Christian Pulisic, there was a lot of bright spots leading up to the goal. He scores the goal, and then after that, which happens all too often, in my opinion, kind of goes missing for long periods of time. And in the moments in which Germany started getting a hold of the ball, that's when you need your guy, as well as scoring the goal, that's when you need your guy to be an outlet, to be a natural outlet for you. Say, give me the ball. I'll resolve an issue right now. Let's push our lines forward. Let's press higher up the field. And let's not sit back here because it's not what we do best. Let's not get disconnected. Let's not get stretched. That's part of leadership as well, not just scoring the world-class goal.
I think, Stevie, from a like, U.S. fan perspective, you thought, well, if there's ever a chance to beat Germany, you looked at the recent record, everything that's happened. Mm. But you pointed it out yesterday, and you pointed again while we were watching this game, the gap in actual talent between the two 11s, uh, even if we're going to call this a bad Germany, is still massive. Yeah, it is. As individuals, yes, it is. Uh, but that's why Greg has to sort the U.S. out and put them in a position defensively where the, the, the difference in overall talent is minimised. You know, playing open against a team that has, on paper, more quality than you, you're generally, nine times out of ten, you're going to come out on the wrong side of it. So you have to come up with a plan. But this is straightforward. This is what the plan should be. When we don't have the ball, we defend as a unit. And OK, if you want to leave Pulisic up front and do, do like a Gareth Bale when he plays for Wales, the other ten are there to get him the ball. If that's how you want to do it, then there's nothing wrong with that either. But you've got to defend as a unit against teams that have better players than you, first of all. And the other thing that you have to do, Stevie, is not turn the ball over coming out of the back, which the United States were doing far too often. Mm -hmm. And it's this, this insistence on, stubborn insistence on, we're going to play out of the back. And, and, and you look around and you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who, who, who are we trying to play the ball out of the back with? What, are are this the players that are equipped to do this consistently against Germany when they come on high pressure? Just because you get out of that pressure two, three times, it doesn't mean that you're suited to do this all the time. And it's moments of recognition by the United States in which you have to say, you know what, let's put it over there. Mm. Let's put it over there and Balogun, go fight for it. Pulisic, go fight for it. Giorena, go fight for it. It's just, to me, it's, it's unnecessary, unnecessary stress that you bring upon yourself against teams that are going to expose how poor you can be when you turn the ball over. That's, that's down to the coach, though. The mm. coach has got to get rid of this, this snobby attitude around the world where everybody, regardless of whether you can or can't do it, you have to do it. And I'll take responsibility <laughs> when it goes wrong. Well, I, I, as a fan, I don't want to see my team who can't play try to play and then we lose goals. I don't, I don't care if we all move forward and we put it in the corners or whatever you do. You've got to find a way to get wins. And the, and the U.S. aren't going to get wins against better opposition by trying to be clever playing it out of the back. Casey, what do you make of what the boys are saying here in studio? Does Greg Halter have this team trying to play a little too cute? Oh, 100%. Uh, it, it's something that we've talked about for years with this team. And I thought, you know, in the, in, in the World Cup, I think they were a little less proactive in doing that because it was very result, results-driven. Um, and so you get into some of these friendly situations where maybe a coach says, okay, let's see what players are capable of doing this. Uh, and I think we saw, again, that, that, that the U.S. at this level isn't ready in possession to be able to compete against the likes of a Germany. So use your strengths. And what were those strengths that we saw at times? We saw the pace of the U.S. attack going at the German defense, which – it is something that Nagelsmann is going to have to sort out because if they're going to leave themselves exposed, they're going to lose a lot of games with the pace of the defense that Germany has. But you have to set your team up, to Steve's point. You have to set your team up in a way that you can get a result against a superior opposition. And playing a team like Germany heads up, yes, the U.S. has a lot of good players, and yes, it's continuing to improve, but we're not quite there yet that you can just play heads up. You attack, we attack, and we'll outscore you. And those frailties at times, and I think Ollie made a really, really good point as well, that if, if Fulkrug in particular and, and Germany as a whole were a little bit more clinical in the final third, it, it wouldn't have been 3-1. It, it would have been even a greater scoreline. So, yes, I think there's a lot of things that Greg can learn, but – the insistence of trying to play out of the back under pressure against great opposition, you know, I thought they learned that a while ago, that it's just, we're just not quite there yet. Since Casey mentioned it, how do you think Julian Nagelsmann will feel first game in charge after his team's performance? If I'm him, I'm happy. Away from home, a long way from home, um, a, a victory. It uh, could, could have been more. Um, got a look at all his players. Yeah. Yeah, 
ton, a ton of positives, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think I don't think he'll be surprised about anything. Uh, I think he must know that defensively he needs to come up with something better than what they have, uh, and Mats Hummels in particular. Uh, I don't believe Sula's the answer either. Um, so that's to me that's where he needs to concentrate because going forward. He's got all the ammunition. Mm. He's got players with ability. He's got experience in the middle of the park. He's got Musiala, who's going to supply his forwards. So uh, he'll be happy, absolutely. Not a bad start. I think it's actually best case scenario for Julian Nagelsmann in that you went down in the game, so that exposed some of your frailties. Uh, you ha and, but you were able to find a way back, and you saw some of the talented players on display in the attacking half. So... Room to get better, room to learn, but you do it by winning, which is what he said was most important coming into this games in his interview with us. He said, look, priority number one is winning. Well, they did that. Coming from behind, scoring three goals, knowing that you could have and should have scored more, and knowing full well that there's a lot of work to be done, I think gives him what he wants. But it's a whole lot easier with the media in Germany and the press and the expectations and the pressure to work from a space that hey, we just won a game. Game one, we won. Now we move on to the next one. And you build some momentum that way. You can, you're allowed to work without people pointing the finger already, without people saying, oh my goodness, Germany, they're terrible. Now, at the very least, those people that were about to point the finger just kind of take a step back, and it allows Julian Nagelsmann to take a step forward. Germany then, in their first game under Julian Nagelsmann, 3-1 winners over the United States. Our thanks to Casey Keller. Always great to have you with us here on ESPN FC. The Bundesliga returns to ESPN Plus in six days' time. Actually, Gio Reyna's Borussia Dortmund taking on Werder Bremen. You can catch that next Friday.